What's going on? This is Ryan with Automatic Comics, and up next, I have got the biggest unboxing that I have ever done. Really excited about this one. Some awesome books, some fun stuff to go through. I also talk about that question that I think a lot of us grapple with in this hobby, and that's, would you rather have that one major key or a number of smaller keys? Stay tuned, let's talk about that, and let's check out these books. All right, so before we get started, please remember to hit that like button and hit the subscribe button if you'd like to see more content like this. Really helps the channel, so appreciate everybody that, uh, you know, that does that, likes the videos, all that kind of stuff. So before we get into these awesome books, I want to touch on that idea of getting that major grail book or getting multiple smaller keys. Because I do think that's something that, whether you realize it or not, it's something that we do grapple with every time we make a purchase. You know, if you're if you're buying any other book and you're not buying that grail book, then that means that you spent that money on something else instead of saving up to get that that big key. And so I think it is actually the decision that most of us make most of the time. It's not going for that big book, but instead going for multiple smaller books. Now, the reason that this came up for me was that in a recent Heritage auction, they had a book that I had been looking for for years. They had a Suspense Comics number three. Now in the thumbnail, I used the Amazing Fantasy 15 as well as the Suspense Comics three because I think more people can relate to the Amazing Fantasy 15. That is a major grail that a lot of people are looking for. Suspense Comics three is kind of like a, a grail for the golden age. It's this Alex Schomburg cover, this good girl art cover. It's really the most expensive non-hero book that exists for the, for the golden age. Now, there are a few reasons that I ultimately ended up getting the multiple books instead of the major book. One was that Heritage pulled that listing. So it was a 1-0 blue label Suspense Comics 3, about the only grade I could ever hope to try and afford. I had set aside, I basically saved up a, quite a bit of money, approximately the amount that you saw in the thumbnail, to go after that book. That's around what I thought it would sell for. And so Heritage ended up pulling that book. I did a whole video on that, and it was because it was a married cover that somebody had basically Frankenstein a book together, which is allowed, but then they sent it into CGC, got a blue label, it's supposed to be a green label. And then when it came up for auction, uh, somebody that was very eagle-eyed on the CGC forums noticed this, they reported it to Heritage, Heritage pulled the listing. Now that book is back up for sale in the next uh, big Heritage auction. It is now back as a green label. The crazy thing is it now doesn't just say it's a married cover, it says it's a married centerfold. So I gave CGC a little bit of leeway on that missing the married cover because the paper, there was paper loss at the staple. But man, missing a married centerfold, that's usually really easy to identify. That I feel like there's no excuse for that um, unless, I mean, because usually you have different colored, the, the paper has aged differently, the state, it's, it's a single staple book, staple's not going to align perfectly. It's usually pretty easy to spot a married centerfold. So I mean, that would have been walkthrough. I hope somebody at CGC got uh, in a little bit of trouble for that one, because that, that was a big miss, in my opinion, on their part. But back to this. Why would someone potentially pick a you know the multiple books instead of one bigger book? Well, for me, it was kind of forced on me, <laughs> because that book got pulled, then I had a bunch of money, and I'm not... Uh, good at like not putting, you know, going out and buying comics when I see good prices on them. So I ended up buying a bunch of stuff. Um, but there are other reasons too. From the business side of things, uh, for me, it's uh, it's a lot harder. If I'm, if I'm buying a really expensive book, it's a lot harder to sell a really expensive book. It's easier to sell a $500 to a $2,000 book than a $10 or $20 or $30,000 book. That's one part of it. Also, if you know me from my channel, I talk about this keeper list. So that Suspense Comics 3 definitely would have been on my keeper list, but I could not have justified keeping the same number of books. So I would have had to have dropped a bunch of books from that list, which would have been a really difficult process for me. Now, I do have two books in this one now that are keepers, but they don't cost nearly as much as that Suspense Comics 3. Uh, and those are going to be the last two that I go through in this. And at least for me, the third part is... Would I get bored of that one bigger book versus having lots of, of other books? And that's something I think I've talked about this with a number of people where it's like, if I just had a Batman one or a Captain America comics one or something like that, 
would I get bored of it? You know, it'd be cool to have it. And then it's like, but I want to see other stuff too. So at least for me, I think I would end up getting bored of that one major key. But let me know in the comments. Let me know your thoughts. Are there any other reasons why, you know, you make that decision or why you didn't make that decision, why you have that one major grail, all that kind of stuff. Now, all right, we've gone through all the, the intro there. Now let's start going through these books. I have 20 raw books and I have nine slabs. So that's the, that's the crazy thing is like that one book, that one Suspense Comics 3, that would I estimated was going to go between twenty dollars and $30,000. So I had saved up to be able to go after that book. Instead of that one book, I end up with 29 different books. So that's one way to, you know, really see the, what the variety that you can get when you don't get that one major book. So I'm going to go through the raws first. I've got everything basically in order of value. The raws are more in order of, of the title that they came from uh, than the slabs in order of value. So let's just get right into these. So the, the first 16 books were a bunch of EC books. So these are, they're pre-code sci-fi, pre-code horror books, some really cool ones. First one here is Weird Science number 14. This is actually Weird Science number three. It, it's one of those things where in the EC titles, they started off at, at 12, then they went up to, I think like 15, and then they restarted at a lower number again and went up again. So there are actually two number 14s. This is the earlier one. I believe this is like 1950. Um, but this one has some, somebody used marker on the cover. I don't think it'll get color touch, uh, even though it's marker, because it's basically, it's, with color touch, a lot of it is with intent. And you can tell that they're just trying to, you know, some kid was like filling in the bubbles and that kind of stuff, not purposefully trying to improve the look of the book. But cool book, Weird Science number 14. Then here's Weird Science number 13. Now this is actually the later one. This is one I think is from like 1952. And so you can see just kind of a cool, weird you know you've got rockets and then you've got like you know old timey night type stuff there so uh, kind of a cross of the the past and the future and dinosaurs in the back for some reason uh, but weird science number 13 then weird science number 15 this is a cool one another you know dinosaur cover i really like this cover this is a cool book uh, but weird science 15 then weird science 18 one of these atomic explosion covers. There are definitely a few of these in these runs, these atomic explosion covers. Uh, it's definitely something that's pretty collectible and also has one of these uh, Ray Bradbury uh, story adaptations in there. But yeah, you know, solid presenting copy of this one. Then the next one, this one was actually used in Seduction of the Innocent. This is Weird Science number 19. This is much more of a horror vibe for a cover because you can see you've got this you know, spaceman that's out there in space that uh, is pretty, pretty dead zombie-ish looking uh, guy out there. And, you know, so this one, Weird Science number 19, actually used in Seduction of the Innocent. And then this is one that I've wanted this book uh, to pick up a copy of this book for quite some time. I've never been able uh, to get one in all the times that I've bid on them. And this is Weird Science number 20. I just like this one because this one has that, you know, that good girl art vibe to the cover too. You've got this one guy that's in the ship with uh, all these attractive women that are basically in stasis, I guess, as they're traveling through space. Um, but yeah, Weird Science 20. I think this is one of the, the cooler uh, covers from this from this title. I also really like the blue look of this one. So that's Weird Science 20. Now we're gonna move into some horror. This one, this is probably, this might be the most expensive of the these horror issues. It's a number of issues, again, from EC, from the Vault of Horror title. Uh, this is issue number 17. Uh, this is a Johnny Craig werewolf cover. Uh, this one's actually a, in pretty decent condition. It just has a couple good-sized tape, uh, tape poles on the front. Um, but yeah, this is a solid copy. You know, so Weird Science, or sorry, so Vault of Horror 17, cool book. Then we've got Vault of Horror 18. I always like this one too. You've got uh, this zombie crawling up out of the, the well behind the guy. Uh, this one has had the, it has two extra staples added and somebody pulled the original staples. You never know why. It'd always be interesting to know why somebody made the decisions they did. Um, then we've got Vault of Horror 21, another cool zombie cover. There, you know, this one, uh, I believe this is a Johnny Craig. Yeah, yeah, it's a Johnny Craig cover. It's a cool one. The guy was feeding people into the alligator pit, but that guy, seems to have gotten out. Then we've got Vault of Horror 22, which is a Frankenstein cover. You've got, you know, Frankenstein, uh, the Frankenstein monster. And so Frozen in Ice, cool book. 
Then we've got Vault of Horror 31. Uh, this one, for some reason, somebody pulled the staples on this book. It is a split spine. It has tape on it, but presents really, really well for what would ultimately be like a 1.5 in the grade. But uh, pretty gruesome cover. This guy, crazy person, smashed this guy in the face with a mallet. Um, so that's Vault of Horror number 31. Then we've got Vault of Horror number 25. I guess that one wasn't in order. So number 25, this is also Johnny Craig. Creepy, you know, ghoul skeleton creature on the front there in a seance. And then this is a this is a cover I've always thought is just really cool. This is a Johnny Craig cover. It's one of these black covers. You've got uh, Vault 436, where this guy looks like he's burning this person for whatever reason. But, uh, but yeah, Johnny Craig cover. This one, this cover just always really pops. Whenever you see it, just with the flames and, and the black background and everything, always super cool cover. Next one, this is one of the, I'd say one of the pricier covers from the Vault of Horror run. Uh, this is Vault of Horror number 37. This one also has the split spine with tape and the staples pulled, uh, but this book is pricey in, in any condition. I, I had another copy that was a split spine that I think sold for like $250 relatively recently. So it is a, it is a pricey book and this one actually presents as well or better. It is a really solid presenting copy, which is a big plus. Uh, despite the, the split spine. So Vault 4, 37, another Johnny Craig cover, hanging cover, one of these brutal ones. Then we've got Vault of Horror 39. Uh, this is kind of like a good girl art bondage type cover. Uh, the, this one, uh, one problem uh, with this one is it has tear seals on the back. I'm considering sending it to CCS to have those tear seals removed. Uh, actually, I'll show that real quick, just so you kind of know what, to look for if uh, with something like tear seals uh, because the person that sold it missed them. <laughs> so uh, so maybe they should watch this and, and learn what they look like too. Uh, but basically, whenever you see something that is an obvious tear, so here there's a tear, here there's a tear, here there's a tear, you expect the paper to separate at that point. But in this one, the paper does not you know, it doesn't separate. There's, you know, you can tell it's like, it's all one piece. And then when you look close at it, let's see if it'll come out on camera. Uh, you can see just like a little bit of residue. There you go on that tear. And so it's just basically a tear seal is just like a small amount of glue or, or something like that. That's, that's on the tear to keep it in place. And, um, but, they, that's one of the easier types of restoration to have removed. And so it would drop the grade, you know, a little bit because now you, you have those things that aren't technically a tear that become a tear. But this is already a lower grade book, you know, something like 2.5 or a 3 range, uh, you know, because it's got a subscription crease in the middle. But still a book that presents pretty well for the grade. But um, another one that is is pretty pricey in the run. Um, but, uh, yeah, another John and Craig cover, but yeah, if you see something like that, that's what a tear seal is, can generally be removed. And then the last one here for the, the horror books is Vault of Horror number 40. Uh, this is, I believe the last issue of the run and it's kind of like a Dracula or vampire type cover. And it's considered to have a relatively, you know, a lower print run similar to Tales from the Crypt 46, that werewolf cover, those, those final issues tend to have lower print runs, and, and this is no exception. So, Vault of Four, number 40. All right, so that's that's all the, the EC uh, sci-fi and horror books. Now we've got a few Batman books. First one here, and, and this one, <laughs> I, I, I picked these up from, uh, from A1 Comics. And uh, my buddy Aaron at Double A Comics, I, I, I felt a little bad because he was going after these two, and uh, so I, I kind of, kind of sniped these from him in the in the claim sale. But these are these are all incomplete, but still these are these are not cheap books um, because of just how early they are in the Detective Comics run. First one here is Detective Comics number forty four, and so you know real early Batman and Robin cover. Robin's first appearance is Detective Comics 38. So this is only six issues after that. Um, but yeah, I think this one's missing the centerfold or yeah, yeah, this one's missing the centerfold. Um, but, uh, but still, so it's a 0.5, but 
you know, it's got a stain and everything, but no big pieces out of the front. That's one of the things I'm often looking for with an incomplete copy. I just, I don't want big pieces missing from, uh, from the front of the book. So, uh, Detective Comics 44. Then the next one we've got here is Detective Comics number 46. Just two issues later, again, very early Robin appearance and, I mean, an early Batman appearance. He's only Detective Comics 27 uh, as his first appearance. And so, again, a one, one that is incomplete, so it's a 0.5, but presents well. You know, these uh, just these books that are, are still great books to have um, just with how nice the covers present and everything. It's got some extra staples, all that, but still. Detective Comics 46. Then the last Detective Comics book here is number 55, where it looks like he's beating up some like some rail workers for some reason. I don't, I don't know why uh, Batman and Robin are, are beating up rail workers. Um, but, uh, but yeah, Detective Comics 55, again, incomplete. I think this one is missing the back cover. Um, but still, the, whole, the same, same thing is true with all of these. The, the front cover presents well, no big pieces missing from it which to me is always a big plus with these, you know, 0 0.5, you know, incomplete type books. All right, then the last raw book here. Uh, this one is from this run that just has, it has some really cool books in the run. Uh, this is Astonishing number four. This is a Bill Everett cover. You've got, you know, they're almost like skeletons or zombies because they don't have, you know, like skeleton type bodies, but they definitely have skull type faces. Um, but yeah, Astonishing number four, it's a lower grade copy, has some moisture damage, that kind of thing, um, but still presents relatively well for the grade. You know, so I thought this was a really cool book. Uh, ended up picking, picking this one up and uh, yeah. Yeah, so Astonishing number four, the final raw book uh, from this, this large lot of books that I have picked up. All right, now let's move on to the slabs. Now these ones are in order of value, lowest value first. First one here, this is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, number two, first print, 9.6, signed and a little, you know, turtle sketch by Kevin Eastman. Um, the way that you can tell the, the first print from the second print is, well, so this one is actually it's uh, got a miscut on the bottom a little bit, so you have this white strip on the bottom. But the way that you can tell the first print from the second print is this little triangle that's down in the corner here. Second print will not have that triangle. First print has the triangle. It's actually from the back cover. It's basically this image is shifted some in the, uh, in, in the second print, and so you don't end up having that triangle. Um, but yeah, 9.6 of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number two, first appearance of April O'Neil, first appearance of the Mousers, you know, second appearance of the Turtles and, and all of that and Splinter and everything. So yeah, cool book. I've also really, I like the cover of this one. I, so if you're not familiar with what this is on the cover, because sometimes it's not real obvious at first, is it's a, it's a Mouser and then you have the reflection of the Turtles in that Mouser. And you know, then there's the, there's the back of that. So yeah. Cool book, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number two. Now, next book up. This is the highest grade copy I have ever had of this book by quite a bit. I think before this one, the highest grade might have been like an 8.0. This is Captain America number 100 in a 9.2. If you ever have people saying like, oh, that's an old label CGC book, they're usually talking about, you know, the ones that are the generation after this. This is an old label <laughs> CGC book. This is what the labels looked like right at the beginning for like the first year. And then they transitioned to what the labels look like. They're relatively similar since then. Uh, but uh, but yeah, Captain America, number 100, 9.2. Beautiful copy of this book. This one is, this one is awesome. But yeah, this is the first time I, I've ever had a copy of this one that's this nice. Uh, so this is basically... When you're talking about the major Marvel heroes when they were doing those, you know, the big premiere issues like they did with Hulk 102, Submariner 1, Iron Man 1, uh, this was effectively Captain America number one for the Silver Age. And uh, and yeah, 9-2 is an awesome, awesome presenting copy of, of this book. Then, next one here. I was really excited to be able to get this book. So... The person that, or one of the people, whether she realizes this or not, that got me 
started getting me into the golden age was uh, someone on Instagram that goes by the name Comic Book Nerd Girl. And it's C and then the number zero and then, you know, M-I-C. Uh, but she like she was one of the people I first saw when I got onto Instagram. She had some incredible Golden Age books. That's the first time that I saw the Suspense Comics number 11, the one that's like this devil cover. And that's what ended up getting me to get that book and then set me down this path of, of getting these other books. It's the first time I saw the Famous Funnies 214, the, uh, the Frank Frazetta cover, the Red Planet cover. But she also had this book. And I had, I had, you know, I follow her page and I was waiting to see if she would ever be willing to sell this book. And finally, one day, very recently, this one came up for sale. She did a, a poster in her story. She said she was selling this book and I contacted her, made an offer and we made a deal. This is Baffling Mysteries, number 22 in a 9.6. This is from Ace uh, Ace Periodicals, which they have a few cool uh, issues in there, or a few cool runs of books. One of them being the Beyond run where, that I've shown recently where it's uh, there's Beyond 25 and 27, which are those skull covers. Uh, they're the same publisher that did the, the baffling run. Now, the crazy thing about this copy, this 9.6, not only is this the highest graded copy of this issue, the next closest is like a 9.0, this ties with one other book from like the Northford pedigree. Uh, I think it's Northford pedigree uh, that it as the highest graded book in the entire run in all of the baffling mysteries run. There are no nine eights. There are only two nine point sixes. I went through and checked the census on all of them. And so I thought that was super cool is that this ties with one other book as the best copy, the best known copy, graded copy uh, from the entire run. And it's got a pretty cool cover. You know, you've got the kind of like the demon or whatever good girl art type cover there. Uh, she's the um, uh, she's the flame queen on there. But yeah, the colors on this thing, 1954 are just ridiculous. I mean, just ridiculous, the cover, the colors on this one. And uh, I remember she said like, she didn't even get this book pressed before she sent it in. So, so she didn't even have this one pressed before she sent it in. Got a 9.6 on this book. Just incredible. So, so yes, I was really excited to uh, be able to pick this one up. And it also it worked out well that I wasn't able to get that, uh, that Suspense Comics 3. And because of that, I had, you know, this money available and was able to, to pick up this book. Uh, so actually, there are three books in here that are keepers. This is one of them. This is one of the ones that's on my, that's going on my keeper list just because I have never had a Golden Age book that's this high of a grade. I think the highest I've ever had, I may have had a nine at one point. Um, it, it was either an 8.5 or a nine. I have never had anything like this. This is just, this is just absurd. So yeah, baffling number 22 and a 9.6. All right, next one. This is a cool book too. This is uh, from the Batman run. This is Batman number 12, but in a 6.5. This is a beautiful copy of this book. This is a World War II cover. So you've got the, you know, War Bonds cover where Batman and Robin are, you know, telling people to buy War Bonds. This is from 1942. Amazing yellow cover. Like I said 6.5. Just an incredible copy of this book. Really bright back uh, back cover as well. You know, always advertising the BB guns on these books. Um, but yeah, I was I was excited to pick up this one, Batman number twelve and a six point five. Just yep, crazy um, and an early Joker appearance. Then we've actually got some uh, some more Silver Age in here. Uh, this is Amazing Spider-Man number fifteen. Uh, this is a seven zero. This is the first appearance of Craven. But uh, this one is signed by Stan Lee. So I actually have two copies of this book now signed by Stan Lee. I've got a 7.0 and I can't remember. I think my other one's like a 5.0 or a 5.5. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I just, I, I know prices on the Amazing Spider-Man stuff have been coming down. But to me, that's when I want to buy those books. Um, I mean, it's Silver Age Amazing Spider-Man. It is a villain that was consistent with Spider-Man for a lot of years, for quite a few years. He's one of the uh, the Sinister Six. I mean, all of that. And, and for me, I don't generally buy signature series books, but the exception I usually make is for Stanley. Stanley's signature series books, I do buy. And, uh, you know, a 7-0 of Amazing Spider-Man number 15, also signed by Stanley. I thought that was 
it's too cool to pass up. So, yep, that one. All right, now, yeah, I mean, they, they just, they keep getting pricier on here. This is another cool one. I mean, they're all cool. <laughs> so uh, I think I'd say this is probably the top issue from this run. Uh, this is Captain Arrow Comics number 26 in a 4.5. This is a classic sci-fi cover. This is an LB Cole cover, and this is the last issue of the run. So there are there are multiple different LB Cole sci-fi type covers. Sometimes I don't like them. Sometimes I do. I, I'm I'm torn sometimes on them. This one is not a keeper book for me, but I do I do like this cover. I think this is a really cool cover. I like the blue background. Um, I like the the contrast of colors on here. You know, I think you know it's definitely Earth in the background, which I think looks cool, and. Yeah, I, I just, this one is one of those LB Cole Golden Age books that, that a lot of Golden Age collectors are going for. And so I thought this was a cool one to have a chance to pick up. Like I said, never owned a copy of this book before. So I was excited to be able to get one and actually a, a really solid presenting grade in a, a 4.5. So, yep, cool LB Cole Golden Age cover. Then jumping back to Batman. So I showed issues 44 and 46. I picked up a graded copy of 45. And so this is Detective Comics number 45 and a 5-0. So the, the claim to fame with this book is that it says it's the third appearance of Joker. But the other important thing is that it's the first time Joker is in the Detective Comics story. So he has that first appearance on the cover uh, a couple issues earlier, but he's not actually in the story. Um, but this is the first time he's in the story of the Detective Comics run. And again, you've got Batman and Robin on the cover there. Robin being the punching bag that he often is, <laughs> you know, which is why I've talked about that before, where where I've said like Bucky as the sidekick for Captain America is awesome. You know, he's always like a badass out there. He's beating people up. He's got like a mace or a, a machine gun or anything that he, he's fighting people with. Whereas uh, Robin is often, you know, just captured or, you know, some type of like comic relief on the cover. But, but still, I mean, this is early. This is 1940. So that also tells you how early those other Detective Comics books were. Those were also um, 1940 and then 1941. Um, but this one, 1940, 5-0, incredible grade for this one. And first time you've got Joker in the, the story in the Detective Comics run. Awesome book. All right, now for the last two, these were both keeper books for me. This one, I have been wanting, this is a pedigree book. I had been wanting a book from this pedigree ever since I heard of it, largely just because I really like the name. I like the name of the pedigree. So this is Catman Comics number 28. This is from the Cosmic Aeroplane Pedigree. And so you can see up on the, the top there, Cosmic Airplane Pedigree. It's also got this, you know, this stamp that's on the, the Catman header there. But when you're talking about the Catman run, this is generally the book that's considered like the favorite from the run. This is another LB Cole book. There are a few that I think are in contention. There are, there are multiple covers from this run that I think are pretty amazing. This one though, this is the most kind of like pre-code horror vibe cover where you've got the you know, the giant skull there. And then you've got, uh, you've got Catman on the cover. You've got his like sidekick kitten on the cover. And then, but I mean, yeah, just the, the awesome skull cover. Awesome LB Cole cover. This one, this one is great. Now, Cosmic Aeroplane, that's actually the name of the store, the comic store that bought this collection. And the story behind this, uh, this collection was that I believe it was the, the original owner's sister that brought them in. And he had been a teacher and like an art teacher. And he used the comics to, uh, I think, to help with his art as well as teach. And so throughout the interior of most of the Cosmic Aeroplane pedigree books, you've got like tracings along the images, lots of little notes in the um, in the margins around the, the, different, uh, the, the different pages of the book. And so I think it's a really cool pedigree. It's got a cool history to it. And this, I mean, to have a pedigree of arguably the top book in the Catman comics run, I mean, with one of the coolest LB Cole covers in general, to me was, was a big deal. I am definitely sending this one back in to get that gold label because I think with this color composition, 
I think that gold label is really going to look great with it. So, so yeah, this is one that I am, that's definitely on my keeper list. I am sending it back in and I am going to get the, uh, the gold label with this one. And so that means this must've been graded probably like two or three years ago, uh, before they started changing around the labels for the pedigrees. Um, but yeah, definitely we'll be getting, uh, getting this one re-slabbed. I'm not going to get it regraded or anything like that. Um, that's not the plan. I think a, a 4.5 is, is where this book is at. Um, but I'm going to definitely get that uh, that gold label. I want that gold label. So, so yep, Catman Comics, number 28, Cosmic Airplane Pedigree, amazing LB Cole cover. And uh, yeah, definitely keeper book and high up on my keeper list for that one. Last book. This is the most expensive book of all of these. Uh, this one is also on the keeper list. I, it's actually replacing a different copy that I have. I have a, a, a 1.8 that I have put up for sale and some people speculated that I got, I, I bought another copy of it, which was correct. Uh, and that's why I ended up putting that book up for sale. And that is Startling Terror Tales, number 11, another LB Cole cover. Uh, again, one of his top pre-code horror covers. So Suspense Comics number eight is the first time that he introduces this like spider skull character. It's on the cover there. Uh, this is like an amped up version of it. That was in maybe like 1945, 1944, 45. This is in 52. So this was about seven or eight years later that he reintroduces this character on the cover and you know has ups the violence you know because that's what everybody was competing for for eyeballs and that's what ended up driving the canvas code authorities you got these more and more violent covers later on and uh and so this is definitely one of the more violent covers from lb cole and classic cover and there are two versions of this one some that have um black around the terror here and some that have blue this is the one that has the blue my other one also has the blue um, but yeah this is replacing my my 1.8 you know and you can pick up some sweet leopard auto seat covers for just 295 each um but yeah really excited about this one so the keeper books the, the new keeper books for me let's see where's that 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 thing so that's where i've said like keeper books for me it's not always about value i mean yeah those two are the most expensive ones but this one i think those other ones are, are more expensive uh but this one it's just i think it's such a crazy book to have the the not only the top of census but tying the top graded book for the entire run uh in a 9.6 then you know this uh the startling terror tales 11 and this one i, I mean i i just I like the pedigrees. I do. I know some people don't care at all about them. I like the pedigrees. I, I think that it's, it's for me, uh, you know, and I've seen some people say that like, well, you know, like, well, I've kept my books in good condition. Why is it important that these people did? And it's like, well, when you're talking about books that were collected back in the forties, the thirties, the fifties, you know, that kind of thing, it wasn't normal for people to keep those comics in those types of conditions. It wasn't normal for to, to have these massive collections of comics. And so those people, the reason you have these pedigrees is that it, it, it basically signifies how unique it was that, that those collectors existed and what they really added to the hobby. Because a lot of these, like you wouldn't have without Edgar church, you wouldn't have most of those highest graded copies. They wouldn't exist. And so that's why those pedigrees to me are, are cool and important. I like having a little bit of history that ties to the book. You know, why, you know, like this person using these books as a teacher. Uh, I think that's always cool. Um, but yeah, real excited about that. So let me know, you know, if you have the option for that, that one major book or getting, you know, multiple, you know, other books, what decision would you make? What decision have you made? Uh, you know, obviously for me, the decision was kind of forced on me because the book that I was going to go after ended up getting pulled. But then, I mean, I don't really mind. I was able to pick up some of these awesome books because of that. So if you enjoyed this video, you saw, hopefully you saw some cool books some books you haven't seen before. Maybe uh, if you'd like to see more stuff like this, I've got more videos over here. Uh, make sure to hit that like button, hit the subscribe button. It should be right around here and I will see you in the next video.